Hi, and welcome to our webinar, Tools for Today's Mental and Physical Health Challenges. I'm Harry Campbell of Biofeedback Resources, and I'll be presenting this webinar for you today. So we're going to talk about some of the current health problems, uh, problems that are, are pretty common today uh, in the U.S. And, and other areas. I'm located in, in New York and, um, of course, follow the news and, and uh, hear about many of the same problems that, uh, that exist in, in other areas as well. So one big problem is the substance abuse, uh, drug dependence and, and abuse. And this is both with illegal drugs and also with uh, prescribed medications that are, are misused and, and also uh, people become dependent on them uh, in, in some of them. Then we have a big problem in pain and, and chronic pain. And some of the some of these problems are, are going to be interrelated. So you have the problem of pain, which in many cases leads to prescription for uh, pain medication. And some of those medications are uh, ones that, that people tend to become dependent on. And also uh, sometimes will we'll end up abusing and in some cases moving to illegal drugs when they're not able to, to get the, the legal ones anymore or the cost is, is, uh, is less. Then you have depression. Depression is another big problem and uh, that also can be related to, to medication use and abuse and dependence. You have suicide which is a big problem and that also can be related to depression, it can be related to pain, it can be related to anxiety. Uh, these things can lead in some cases to, to suicide and people are feeling hopeless and this is a problem with uh, all ages and different uh, occupations in the military and so on. You've heard of, of celebrities recently uh, and so on. So it's a, it's a major problem. And you have hypertension, which also would be related to uh, other cardiovascular problems. And this is a, a one that is often related to, to lifestyle and so on. But again, it's something where medication is, uh, is, is often prescribed sometimes effective but uh, sometimes not so effective and multiple medications often are prescribed uh, and, and there's sometimes control and, and sometimes there's still difficulty controlling so we'll talk about that more and heart disease is, is related to that uh, heart disease is, is a big problem in, in the US and, and in other areas and it's it's one that we lose a lot of uh, lives to and we have stroke, which is also can be related to other things like uh, hypertension and, and heart disease and, and so on. And this is is a, a problem that uh, also costs many lives. So we'll talk about these, and we'll talk about um, tools that are helpful in in, uh, in in dealing with these besides medications, which can be effective. Also, we have anxiety. Don't want to forget about that. That's also a big problem and often treated by medication. Also can be related to other things like we talked about, uh, dependence and abuse on uh, of the medications and also in some cases where it's not successfully dealt with it, it can lead to uh, suicide unfortunately in, in some cases so 
we we have of course medication and surgery which tend to be the two main methods of, of treatment uh, in in this country anyway in the, in the US and possibly in, in some other countries but definitely here and, and medication and surgery are and can be very effective in, in many situations and, and may be the best uh, method of treatment in, in many situations but we want to talk about some alternatives so alternative medicine is, is one term that is used when we want to look at ways of dealing with things different than the sort of standard medication and surgery we also have some other terms the definitions are, are it can be somewhat different, but alternative may seem like we want to use other methods instead of medication or surgery, and that can be problematic sometimes when you're uh, talking to people that are uh, working in medicine because it, it's they may feel like we're trying to get rid of them or replace them or feel like they or, or say that they're not important or necessary and that everything can be treated in, in other ways and that's not what we're really trying to say complementary medicine may sound a little bit better because it's saying that we want to use other methods in addition to or along with medication and surgery if necessary and then another term might be even better integrative medicine and this is where you have hopefully teams of people that have different skill sets and different um, backgrounds education and, and um, abilities and methods of, of treatment working together body mind behavioral and so on to help people to get better or to maintain their uh, their health so I think the integrative medicine uh, term is, is probably one of the better ones. So we want to look at other options besides the medication and surgery. So biofeedback is, is the tool that I'm going to be talking about mostly today. There are other tools, which I, I'll touch on, but the the really the, the, the main rest of, of this presentation is going to be dealing with biofeedback is, is which is, is what I um, know best then you also have microcurrent therapy which uses electrical stimulation to uh, help with things like pain anxiety and so on and also it can be used if you, if you use uh, cranial electrostimulation where you're putting the uh, electrical stimulation to the head which produces uh, a relaxed state and that can help with anxiety insomnia and, and depression then you have magnetic therapy which instead of using electrical energy it's using uh, magnetic energy that also can be effective in many situations and perhaps I'll do some other presentations on, on some of those uh, therapies in in, uh, in the future we have behavioral management and so this has to do getting into um, how people are, are living what they're doing um, lifestyle and so on we have nutritional therapy which I'm not going to get into in this presentation but it's very important and can in, in many cases be the key to a person getting better or maintaining good health lifestyle changes we look at things like exercise stress management etc and these can be very important that goes along with the nutritional therapy so uh, in many cases if you have an integrative uh, medicine setting you might have people that are experts in all these areas to work with a person to improve their health so since I'm going to be focused on biofeedback, we'll give a definition of biofeedback. We use computerized technology to help you learn to control or manage your stress responses. We use instruments that measure things like muscle tension, heart rate, 
brainwave activity and it feeds back that information to the person that it's measuring it from in order to help them to learn control over these signals or processes. Here I'll give you a list of the types of biofeedback. So we have really two main branches of, of biofeedback. You have peripheral biofeedback and you have neurofeedback. You may see uh, some other um, references to biofeedback, one being quantum biofeedback, and there may be some other devices that uh, are labeled as biofeedback, but they really shouldn't be uh, because they, they lack the true definition of biofeedback where we're measuring a signal, feeding it back to the person, and the person is learning how to change the, um, the signals, not something just outwardly changing it for them, like, say, for instance, a microcurrent therapy or magnetic therapy would do. So you have peripheral biofeedback and you have neurofeedback. So we'll talk about peripheral biofeedback first. So I'll, I'll list the things that we measure in peripheral biofeedback. You have EMG, which is electromyograph that measures muscle activity. You have skin temperature. It measures the temperature of the surface of your skin, usually on your hands or your feet. Skin conductance measures changes in the amount of sweat on the hands or the, uh, or the feet, usually the hands. Then you have heart rate and heart rate variability. Uh, by the way, the skin temperature is measured by a sensor being put on your finger. Skin conductance usually is measured by uh, sensors, two sensors being put on either your fingers or your palm. And heart rate or heart rate variability is measured either by a sensor that goes on the finger called a photoplethysmograph sensor or a uh, EKG, a set of EKG sensors which would either go on your torso or on your wrists or uh, yeah or on your on your wrist the, those would be the two options and you see here in this uh, photo uh, an example of someone that is being monitored for for biofeedback and they actually have three screens here and in this case there some of the information uh, for the biofeedback is on the middle screen and the two outside screens would be uh, for virtual reality, which is sometimes used in biofeedback, but not, not always. But this would be the process where you'd have someone sitting, usually sitting in a chair with some sensors on them, measuring their physiology, either from their hands, from their head, from their waist or other places. And they're seeing the graphs or other displays that are showing what's being measured and they're learning how to control to a degree the uh, signals that are being measured. And they can do this th through uh, the, the feedback itself and also through relaxation techniques like diaphragmatic breathing and progressive muscle relaxation and guided imagery and things like that. Then we also have respiration. So respiration is usually measured by a belt that goes around the abdomen or the chest. And it measures each time the person takes a breath in, the belt would stretch. And then when they exhale, the belt would go back to its normal state. And that stretching is recorded as a, as a breath. So that's peripheral biofeedback. Now we have neurofeedback. And neurofeedback includes EEG, or electroencephalograph, that measures electrical activity from the brain. And we have HEG, which is hemoencephalograph, and that measures um, brain blood flow. So with the EEG, you would usually have sensors on the scalp uh, and possibly the earlobes, and that gives you information on the screen so the person can learn how to regulate their brain waves. With the HEG, you have a headband that looks like this, and the, there's sensors built into this headband which are detecting changes inside the skull of the, the uh, temperature as the temperature changes based on 
changes in the brain blood flow. So what, what does biofeedback do for healthcare? And it, it's a tool, but uh, in, in, the, in healthcare, it, it can provide a, a non-drug alternative for patients. And for the, the provider, it can improve the outcomes for the patients um, through self-regulation, the, the uh, training the body to stay well. And uh, so we have a, a different um, model. We, we're, we're looking at wellness in, some, in, in many cases instead of illness, so trying to keep people well. Um, and, and for the practice, it also can increase the income to the, the healthcare providers because it, we're adding a service. So it, it's benefit to both the, the patients and for the, the professionals of the practice or providers. Now, what kind of providers can use biofeedback? We, we have uh, psychologists are probably one of the largest groups that provide biofeedback. And you have mental health counselors. Medical doctors also can provide biofeedback. They usually don't provide it themselves hands-on uh, because they uh, honestly can make more money uh, doing some of the other things that they do. And they usually will hire a technician or a psychologist or other type of therapist to provide biofeedback in their practice if they want to have biofeedback in their practice. Then you have chiropractors, nurses, and nurses can provide uh, biofeedback for stress management, but one of the specialty areas that they may provide biofeedback for, which we're not really gonna cover in this uh, presentation, but there's a, a form of biofeedback called uh, pelvic muscle disorder biofeedback, which includes uh, working with people who have incontinence, usually uh, urinary incontinence, and also pelvic pain. So that's a, an area that nurses uh, and, and also physical therapists uh, tend to specialize in with biofeedback. You have mas massage therapists can also use biofeedback, uh, dealing, especially dealing with muscle relaxation. And um, others, uh, I didn't list um, social workers there, they can also use biofeedback and physical therapists as well. So this is what biofeedback looks like uh, the patient would be in this case sitting in a, a chair in a relaxed position they've got sensors on their head that is uh, probably measuring muscle activity and then they've got some other sensors on their hands that are measuring uh, skin conductance and uh, skin temperature these wires uh, are connected to the disposable sensors on the, on the head that just stick on and they just peel off uh, when you're done, these wires go into the instrument. There's some other wires going from the person's fingers into the instrument. And then they get the display on the screen so that they can see how they're doing. You can see the changes moment by moment. And also, they usually will have audio feedback. You can see the computer speakers here. So even if they have their eyes closed, they would be able to hear sounds that change based on the signals that are being recorded. So you're either working eyes open and seeing the graphs on the screen, or you may work eyes closed and, and work with just the audio feedback to uh, know what you're doing. And then the diagram on the left here is basically just showing the uh, how biofeedback works, really. This is a diagram. So you have the person, uh, signals are being recorded from them through the instrument going to the computer. The computer then is feeding back the information to the person, and then they learn how to change those signals that are then being recorded. So now let's talk a little bit about some of the problems. So you have drug abuse and dependence. There's some statistics here. Um, the uh, 2016 National Study on Drug Use and Health estimated 28.6 million Americans aged 12 and over used illicit drugs during the month prior to the study. That means that about one in 10 people struggle with some level of substance abuse 
or substance use, including addiction to prescription drugs. The U.S. makes up 5% of the world's population and consumes about 80% of the prescription opioid drugs. Prescription opioid drugs contribute to 40% of all U.S. opioid overdose deaths in 2016. More than 46 people per day died from overdoses, including prescription opioids. And here's a, a link to a website that uh, might be of interest that has more statistics. I'll just click on it here for a second and we'll show what this website includes. Okay, so this is the website. This is Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and it lists here U.S. opioid prescription uh, prescribing rate maps. So let's just take a look here. It has uh, data, total number and rate of opioid prescriptions dispensed. And this is from 2006 through 2017. So you can see here that um, we had in 2006, the prescribing rate per 100 persons was 72.4. It went up to in 2012, you can see 81.3. There's some drop off here, luckily. I think this is probably after we started to see that uh, there was a big problem. Uh, here in table two, it, it shows total number and percentage of counties with available opioid prescribing data. And you can see the list there. And so this just has a lot of information that would be useful if you want to learn more about the problem. Okay, so I'm going to minimize that and we'll continue. So drug abuse and dependence. U.S. Prescrip uh, prescription rates, and you see 2007, 75.9 per 100 people, and then you see in 2008, it went up to 78.2, 2009, 79.5, and 2010, 81.2. And you can see that the raw numbers there, we're talking hundreds of, um, well, actually, we're, we're talking uh, in, in uh, hundreds of millions of, of, uh, of people there. Now, another thing, uh, this is related to uh, pain and also some of the other problems. Uh, there's, there's, uh, of course, a big push to legalize use of marijuana, both for for medicinal uses and and recreational. And you know, in in some ways, it could could be a good thing. And, and there, there, of course, can be some problems related to it as well. You know, it, 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 for example, you know, we have legalized um, alcohol use uh, and and so there's, it's good in some ways because it takes away some of the uh, crime related to um, alcohol being produced and, and used illegally. But then, you know, it, it is a substance that can be harmful, and if abused especially, it can be harmful. Same thing with marijuana. It can be abused and it can be harmful for people. In some cases, it could help with things like pain and so on, and, and so in that way it could be a help. But it's something that has to be managed properly. But you can see there's, there's this movement to, um, to legalize, and it, it's growing, and it's, it's coming, and doesn't seem like it's going to stop. So there, there also can be issues with people abusing it and getting carried away with it. And, and also we have to think about people driving and working under the influence and so on. So this is uh, a, another link here. If we click on I'm going to click on this. And it shows, uh, let's see if we can continue to the site. OK, so this shows uh, governing the states and localities. Um, state marijuana laws in 2018 map. 
So this is showing 33 states in the District of Columbia currently have passed laws broadly legalizing marijuana in some form. And this is listing the uh, the different areas. So you have the, the dark green showing medical marijuana broadly legalized. And so you can see in Arizona, New Mexico, and Montana, and so on, New York. Um, and then you have the, the light green marijuana legalized for recreational use. California, Oregon, Washington, Maine. Uh, what do we have here? Vermont, Massachusetts, Michigan. So that's growing. Um, and then you have the gray areas where there's no broad laws legalizing marijuana, like Texas and Kansas and Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, and so on. So that's just giving you an idea of how widely um, this is happening. Uh, so, you know, again, it, it, it just shows that it's, it's a substance and there's pros and cons to it, but the legalization is, is, uh, is spreading. Now we have pain, and this is one of the, the things that uh, marijuana is used for, is, is working with especially chronic pain. Instead of using some of the, the stronger uh, drugs, like the opioids. And um, so here you see some statistics. Chronic pain uh, in the prevalence uh, related and in, in just compared to some of the other problems. So you have 100 million um, Americans that uh, suffer chronic pain. You have uh, diabetes is 25.8 million. Coronary heart disease, uh, 16 million, 16.3 uh, million. And stroke, you have 7 million. And cancer, 11.9 million. This is showing some statistics in, in for pain. So you have 25.3 million American adults suffer from daily pain. 23.4 million American adults report a lot of pain. 25.4 million um, experience Category 3 pain. 14.4 million experience the highest level of pain, Category 4. And then American adults with Category 3 or 4 pain were likely to have worse health status, use more health care, and suffer from more disability than those with less severe pain. This is an example of what EMG sensors for biofeedback look like on uh, placed on a person's forehead, and this would be able to measure muscle activity in their face, and their scalp, and their jaw, and so on. And it's used for helping people learn to relax their facial muscles. Pain and muscle tension are related in many cases. Uh, muscles are meant to provide movement and maintain posture. When they're not doing this, they should be resting. When muscles stay tense for long periods of time, pain can be triggered or made worse. And so that's where the uh, EMG biofeedback comes in. It helps us to uh, get people to relax the, the muscles more. Now, there's a, a document called Evidence-Based Practice in Biofeedback and Neurofeedback. Uh, there was a 2004 version, 2008 version, and there's a, a newer 2016 version. Um, and what it does is it rates the uh, bio, the use of biofeedback or neurofeedback, the effectiveness of the use of biofeedback or neurofeedback for different conditions. And the scale is from one to five, one being the, the least evidence of, of uh, effectiveness and five being the most evidence of effectiveness. So for uh, chronic pain, it's rated at, at a four on this uh, scale of one to five. So uh, EMG heart rate variability and EEG neurofeedback modalities have been used successfully for the treatment of chronic pain. Next thing we'll talk about is anxiety. Anxiety statistics, 18% uh, 
2.1% of adults in the U.S. experience an anxiety disorder such as post-traumatic stress disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and specific phobias. And if we go to this uh, link here, we'll see a website that will show us some more information. So this is the Mental Health America website, 2017 State of Mental Health in America Prevalence data. And it has uh, six measures that make up prevalence ranking. Uh, it lists those here. And it shows by states uh, the ones that um, have more prevalence than, than others. So you have prevalence of mental illness, and then you have adult prevalence of mental illness, adults with any men mental illness, adults with dependence or abuse of illicit drug or alcohol, adults with serious thoughts of su suicide, youth with at least one past year major depressive episode, youth with stress, I'm sorry, use with severe major depressive episode, and so on. So it uh, use youth with dependence or abuse of illicit drugs. So this is a useful website to look at statistics for uh, mental health. Now, we talked about medications being one of the treatment methods and so this is a list of some of the medications that are used for treating um, anxiety and you can see a lot of common medications here this is a, another link here to a website of medications that are used for anxiety drugs to treat anxiety disorder and it talks about the treatment And it lists the, the different medications, and it also lists some of the side effects and how well the medications seem to, to work. So without going through the whole list of, uh, of the website here, I just wanted to show you that. I want, I want you to have some resources here for websites and so on that, uh, that you can check out further. So these, this is just a, a list of some of the side effects of these medications. And this is why even when they are effective, there, there can still be a problem. Because if, a, if people are having some of the, especially the more severe side effects, they may not use the medication as they should, or it may just be relatively unbearable and they, they may need a, a different medication. So they may switch to another medication, which might be better, but may have different side effects. So you have drowsiness, problems with balance, dizziness, headaches, nausea, dry mouth, muscle weakness, diarrhea, sexual dysfunction, constipation, blurred vision, weight gain, and dependence. So that's a lot. Uh, now we'll talk about skin conductance, another biofeedback modality. And what this does is it measures changes in how much sweat there is on the palm side of your fingers. When a person is becoming anxious, their hands sweat more. It's not always noticeable to the person, but the biofeedback sensors detect, measure, and display it on a screen, helping to bring awareness and build control. This is an example of a, a screen, biofeedback screen, that was measuring skin conductance. Here you can see the level going down as a person relaxed. Here you can see a person becoming stressed. So it went up. And then they relaxed a little bit, and then they became stressed again, relaxed a little bit, became stressed again, relaxed a little bit, became stressed again, so on. So you can see their, their ending level was higher than, than where they started. Okay. Skin conductance is, uh, is a measure of sympathetic nervous system activation and indicates emotional reactivity. So in this graph, you can see a difference. Uh, 
this one shows recovery after reaction, whereas the previous graph showed little or no recovery. So here you can see there was a reaction, and here it's going lower. So it ended actually lower than where it started. So that's what we would want a person to be able to get to. Instead of having it go up, 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 we train them so that they can bring the level down. And that's part of what we do with biofeedback. So the goal in skin conductance biofeedback training is to learn to reduce the amount of reaction and speed up the recovery time to baseline through relaxation. Now, biofeedback is rated as for effectiveness for anxiety on a, at a level four on the, this uh, one to five scale. So that's that's a, a good rating. Shows that it's effective. Now. Uh, before we go further, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the, the business of biofeedback. So if you're a, a, a healthcare professional, uh, practitioner, uh, and, and you're looking uh, for uh, possibly using the tool of biofeedback or neurofeedback uh, in your practice to uh, help your clients and also to, to increase your, your business, uh, we'll just talk a little bit about that. So let's just look at potential uh, income, just examples. This is not uh, cast in stone, but it's, it's an example. So for an initial stress assessment where we put all the sensors on and we take the person through a period of, of baseline stressors, recovery, and we're measuring muscle tension, skin temperature, skin conductance, respiration, heart rate, all at the same time, and getting what the baseline levels are and what we uh, are going to plan to to work with uh, how the person reacted and what things they need to work on more, um, we would do that uh, test in the beginning before we started to do the actual biofeedback therapy. And with neurofeedback, it's a little bit different. The testing uh, might include a, a basic EEG assessment, but it might also include a full brain map. And those uh, assessments could, would cost even more than this. But this is a basic uh, initial assessment and range between $150, $250. Um, if you did 12 sessions at $75 to $150 a piece, um, and a post-assessment where you're doing that test that, uh, or similar test that we did uh, in the beginning, again, $150 to $250. And so if we looked at one person, that's between $21 and $2,300. If you had 30 patients for the year, then that's an additional 63,000 to 69,000 uh, just for, for biofeedback. And then usually, you know, this can either be patients that are coming in just for biofeedback or maybe they were already in the practice and you add biofeedback uh, for those patients. So you can see it could be a considerable amount that you can add. Uh, and this is, being conservative, um, and you know the number of patients could vary, and the, the amounts that you charge could vary, and so on. But just this is just an example to give an idea. So uh, for the uh, the business side of, of uh, adding biofeedback. So if you decided that this is something that you want to do, you, first you would need to get some training. So the training uh, is usually done in a 42-hour course. Um, Equipment uh, can vary in, in cost depending on the, the models, the manufacturer, how many channels, the features and software and so on. And the after you've done your training, got your equipment, you're going to want to get uh, mentoring and support so that you can really get good at it and, and, uh, and get a, a really good foundation and start so that you could be successful in, in that. Uh, we we uh, offer that, and other people offer it as well. The certification is is uh, provided by an organization called the BCIA, which is the Biofeedback Certification International Alliance. Uh, they have a website, bcia.org, and the fees for becoming certified, aside from the training and, and mentoring that you would do, but the, the fees for uh, applying for certification and the testing are about 4 to 25. And um, 
that's that's really what it would take to 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 get started. So if you if you want to do this and and you want uh, us to help you with that, uh, you can uh, you can call my office and you can give us your information. Or if you, if you'd like to register for our next seminar, we have a list of of our uh, uh, training schedule on our website biofeedbackinternational.com, or you can call our office and we can give you what the um, what the dates and, and locations are. If you mention this uh, this presentation, we can uh, offer you an unadvertised discount. So just remember to, to mention that when you call. And our uh, our seminar schedule is available on our website, biofeedbackinternational.com. All right, so now let me get back to the material here. So we'll talk about depression, and these are uh, some statistics uh, on depression. Depression is the leading cause of disability in the United States among people between ages 15 and 44. This is, of course, according to the National Network of Depression Centers. Now, I'll look at this um, link here. And this is the National Network of Depression Centers, and they've got some nice infographics here that tell you about some of the issues related to depression. So economic impact, $210.5 billion lost earnings per year due to serious mental illness. Depression is the leading cause of disability in the United States, um, ages 15 to 44. Depression ranks among the top three workplace issues in the United States, along with family crisis and stress. And this talks about treatment. 80% of those treated for depression show an improved uh, improvement in symptoms within four to six weeks of starting treatment. Two-thirds of people with depression do not actively seek nor receive proper treatment. 41% of adults in the United States with mental health condition received treatment in uh, 2015. And 51% of children, 8 to 15, with mental health condition received treatment in 2015. Then it talks about research funding, suicide statistics. Suicide is the second leading cause of death, ages 15 to 44. There's one death by suicide every 12 minutes in the U.S. Deaths by suicide in the United States in 2014 were 42,773. 250,000 people become suicide survivors each year in the United States. And then you have some statistics here for veterans. 22 veterans lose their lives to suicide every single day. Veterans age 50 to 59 have the highest rate of suicide. Only half of all returning veterans who need mental health treatment actually receive it. And the rate of PTSD among veterans is 15 times higher than civilians. So those are some interesting statistics. Major depressive disorder affects more than 16.1 million Americans, adults, or about 6.7% of the U.S. population age 18 and older per year. Medications, SSRIs, antidepressant, anti... Uh, why do I keep forgetting how to say that? Ant <laughs> anxiolytic, uh, antipsychotic. Those are some of the medications. Um, depression is uh, another thing that biofeedback is used for, and it's uh, it's one of the lower uh, effectiveness ratings. Uh, it's rated at a, at a two on the scale of one to five for effectiveness. So it's 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 has some effectiveness, possibly effective, but it, it, depression can be very difficult in, in many ways for uh, to treat. But I wanted to make sure and include that because I don't want you to think that uh, you know biofeedback is just going to be high, high effectiveness for every single thing. There are some things that it shows less effectiveness, in, and and this is based on evidence of of, of research. So if, if there's not a lot of research shown for it, then it, the, the rating is going to be lower. Then we have hypertension. About one point, one of uh, three U.S. adults, or about 75 million people, have high blood pressure. 
high blood pressure contributes to about 1,000 deaths per day. And here is a link that shows some facts about hypertension. So this is heart.org and it shows uh, information about monitoring your blood pressure, the facts about high blood pressure, it talks about what is high blood pressure and how is it diagnosed and so on. Here's some numbers for normal elevated hypertension stage one, hypertension stage two, so on hypertensive crisis and it's got a video here you can watch and so on so it has a lot of uh, helpful information okay so here's the infographic that shows a lot of the information that you would find there um, is estimated Costs associated with high blood pressure, $51 billion. $47.5 billion in direct medical expenses. Only about half of the people with high blood pressure have their condition under control. And here it says reducing average population systolic blood pressure by only 12 to 13 millimeters of mercury could reduce. Uh, stroke by 37%, coronary heart disease by 21%, deaths from cardiovascular disease by 25%, deaths from all causes by 13%. Uh, um, and let's see, so it has some other good tips there. So here are some of the hypertension medications. Just back up here. So these are all medication, different medications. They have different effectiveness and they have different ways of working. And of course, they have different uh, side effects. Here's some of the side effects that can be caused by some of these blood pressure medications. And you know, everybody doesn't get all of the side effects, but uh, you know, usually people will get something. And depending on how bad the side effects are, a person might either be able to uh, continue taking the medication or they may need to switch to a different one. For hypertension, biofeedback is rated at a 4 on the scale of 1 to 5. So that's a good rating. It shows that it's very effective and there's research data to show that. Stroke is another area. Um, statistics. Uh, Stroke accounts for one out of every 19 deaths in the U.S. each year. About 795,000 people experience a new or recurrent stroke. Stroke is the leading cause of serious long-term disability in the U.S. And biofeedback is used for helping people that have experienced a stroke. And it's rated at, at a 2 on a scale of 1 to 5 for effectiveness. Um, you can look at it also another way is, is that using biofeedback with a person who hasn't had a stroke can reduce the likeliness that they would have a stroke because things like hypertension and so on would, uh, would be uh, less of a problem that would possibly lead to stroke. But now let's look at another one of the biofeedback modalities. You have heart rate variability. And it uh, looks at changes in breathing pattern and rate. Uh, they can produce very clear and significant changes in heartbeat activity. So this is this blue line is showing a person's breathing that's being measured by this belt that goes around their abdomen. So as they inhale, it goes up. They exhale, it goes down. Inhale up, exhale down. This is showing their heart rate being graphed from a, sen a sensor that's probably on their finger. So that's actually going up as a person inhales and down as they exhale, up as they inhale, down as they um, exhale. And that's healthy for that to happen. Also, we look at um, the 
phase relationship between heart rate and respiration rate, resulting in the most efficient gas exchange and the greatest oxygen saturation. So it's not only the mechanics of the breathing and the heart rate changing, but it also affects the CO2 and oxygen balance. And there's a, a, a separate biofeedback modality that is called a, 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 cap, a capnometer. Uh, this is one called a capno trainer. And it measures the, the CO2 and the breath as a person breathes out. And it's a partial pressure of the carbon dioxide and the, the uh, air that the person breathes out uh, at the end of the expiration. This type of feedback provides a patient with continuous information about the end tidal CO2. And the goal of this training is to normalize the end tidal CO2 to about 5% or 36 torr. In this state, the body regulates blood pressure and gas exchange more effectively. It increases uh, it increased barrel reflex gain also means that the cardiovascular system creates large-scale heart rate increases and decreases when a client inhales and exhales. This in turn translates into greater heart rate variability. And heart rate variability biofeedback might reduce anxiety and depression because the nucleus of solitary tract, which controls the barrel reflexes, is centrally located within the limbic pathways. And that's according to Paul Lehrer. Heart rate variability biofeedback technology plays a key role in this training by giving immediate measurable evidence of the powerful effects of modified breathing on the state of the nervous system. And so now I just want to talk a little bit uh, about the business models for biofeedback. So there's a few different ways you can do this. One is you, if you're in private practice, uh, you would have to be a licensed healthcare practitioner to be able to provide biofeedback independently. If uh, you're, you're uh, not an independent practitioner, you can provide services for other health facilities as an employee or independent contractor. Of course, you have to check your local laws and um, the license uh, rules and so on. The other thing is you can uh, provide biofeedback uh, fee for service, not dealing with insurance companies. For non-clinical services like performance enhancement, stress management, stress reduction, relaxation, you can um, do this without uh, a license uh, if you're just using it for those things, not clinical, not like for the things that we've been covering in this uh, presentation like anxiety, depression, and so on. And these are some of the billing codes that are commonly used when you're uh, working with insurance. You have 90901, which is biofeedback by any modality. 90876, which is uh, basically it's, it's biofeedback. It's psychotherapy incorporating biofeedback. Uh, this is a, sort of the technical um, definition here. So with this, this 90876, and there's also a 90875, which is just a shorter amount of time, you would have to be qualified to, to do psychotherapy to use that code. And again, you have to check your local rules and your insurance company rules and so on to be exact on these. And there are, there are other codes that are probably coming along, depending on when you're watching this, things may have changed and so on. So... Then uh, we've talked about peripheral biofeedback. Now we'll talk a bit about neurofeedback. Uh, so we, when we're dealing with neurofeedback, we're dealing with electrical activity from the brain. And this is divided into different frequencies, uh, which we label as delta, and theta, and so on. And they're associated with different mind states. So you have delta for deep sleep. You have theta. Uh, four to seven hertz for creativity and attention, daydreaming, depression. Uh, you have alpha, eight to 12 hertz, meditation, inner calm, peacefulness. SMR stands for sensory motor rhythm, and that's state of being internally oriented, stillness, relaxed thought. Then you have beta, 13 to 21 hertz, focused, active thinking. Then you have high beta, which is associated with anxiety, overthinking, and OCD, 
and that's 20 to 32 hertz. Uh, in some cases, the high beta can also be associated with uh, certain types of peak performance. Then you have gamma, 38 to 42 hertz, which is associated with learning and peak performance. So the, all of these different frequencies go on in the brain at different levels at different times. And so what we do with the EEG is we teach people how to regulate that, uh, the the amount of the, the different brain waves. So with the EEG, we have to prep the skin. We put sensors on the head and the earlobes with conductive paste. And the person gets visual and auditory feedback to let them know when they're meeting the goals that we've set. So this is just showing what it looks like to prep the, uh, the site and put the, the sensors on. You can see a sensor on the scalp and then sensors on the earlobes, and that's what it looks from the looks like from the back. This is a, a example of what one of the feedback screens might look like. This is one screen that has a lot of stuff on it. So you have a raw signal for the EEG. You have different bandwidths uh, or uh, frequency bands that we're training. So this bar would be connected to these settings. So that would be a delta 2 to 4 hertz. This one is a SMR 12 to 15 hertz. And then this one is an EMG, which is 43 to 59 hertz. So you have these bars showing the amplitude changing. And the line going across is a threshold or a goal. So for these two outer ones, we want to be below the bar. And for this middle one, we want to be above the bar. So when all three of those conditions are met, we would have this picture that moves, we get some sound that comes on, and when we maintain that condition of meeting all three of these for a period of time, we get a point here. So the person would use this type of screen to train with. This is an example of a recording screen where we have our raw signal and we've got our spectral graphs, uh, two-dimensional and three-dimensional and some other information here. And so we might use this just for recording, but not for training. This is an example of screen that we might use for training. It's a dual monitor, so you would have two screens. This would be the screen that the technician or therapist would, would look at. And then this would be the screen that the patient or client would look at. So they have less technical information on their screen and it's more just the basic feedback to let them know whether they're meeting the goals or not. In EEG training or neurofeedback, the, the goals are chosen by considering the EEG activity at certain sites that apply to the symptoms of interest. If it's determined that there is not enough of a certain brain wave, for example, beta, a reward is given when that brain wave is increased. If there is too much of a certain brain wave, for example, theta, a reward is given when that brain wave is decreased. These goals can be combined so that feedback is only given when all conditions are met. This is an example of what a before uh, uh, treatment or, or therapy, the, the brain wave activity might look, and you notice there's a lot of spikes in the amplitude of the, some of the frequencies, especially the lower frequencies in delta and theta. So you can see a lot of high amplitude. And if we go to an after picture, this is from the same person, you can see that there's a lot less activity here. It looks much calmer than the previous one. So that's after training. And this is an example of a 19-channel, well, this is actually a 24-channel system, but it's recording 19 channels of, of brainwave activity. And we're, we're using a cap that has 19 sensors in the cap. And we squirt some conductive gel into each one of these holes. There's a cable that comes out of the cap, and it goes into the front of this instrument. It records the activity from each of those 19 sites and gives us information. So this is what we would call a brain map. Uh, it's a part of a report from a brain map. And we get data from all of the different sites. We can see 
for the different frequencies, one hertz, two hertz, three hertz, and so on, what the absolute power is. And we can see areas that have too much activity or areas that don't have enough activity. So this is the legend here. So the middle would be normal, quote unquote normal, compared to a normative database. And going to the left, as it goes blue here, that would be showing uh, one, two, three standard deviations lower than normal. And then going to the right, you have one, two, three standard deviations higher than normal. So if you have blue, that means that there's the, the level is too low. So we might want to increase activity there. If it's red, then the level is too high. We would want to decrease activity for those frequencies. This is 11 hertz, that's 12 hertz in those areas. Games are sometimes used to help reward progress. So we have um, some games that would, would progress based on the person meeting the goals or not. Uh, the reinforcement of the feedback conditions the brain to switch to and stay in the more appropriate state more often. So this is a game that uses a skateboard rider to show when you're meeting the goal or not. And there are other games that would have sports like baseball or um, you, you might have uh, an airplane flying or a car driving and so on. And the progress of the game is connected to the person meeting the physiological goals or not. Uh, so we talked about the income potential. Again, you know, with 30 patients, you could uh, see between 63,000 and 69,000 um, for completing those patients. And if this is something that you do want to um, to do, you know, the, we have the, the training available, the equipment available, the mentoring, and the certification is something that would not go directly through us, that goes directly through BCIA, uh, but we can give you all the information on that. Uh, and this is the contact information here. So you can uh, call us at uh, toll-free if you're in the U.S., 877-669-6463. Um, if you don't want to use the toll-free number or if you can't because you're outside of the U.S., you can dial 914-762-4646, and you can get us that way. You can also visit our website, biofeedbackinternational.com, for information. and um, I think that is mainly uh, what I wanted to cover here. I want to thank you for participating in this. If you have any questions, you can type them into the chat section here. I'll wait a few minutes to see if you have any questions. You can type them into the chat section in the GoToMeeting panel. Uh, if not, if you're viewing this as a recording, you can um, always give me a call. Or you can send me an email. My email address is harry at biofeedbackinternational.com. Or you can also just visit our website, biofeedbackinternational.com, and you can click on Contact Us, uh, and, and, we can, and you can get a message to me that way. You can also uh, look at a lot of the information on our website uh, that tells you about the biofeedback training and neurofeedback training. And there's a lot of free information. You can take free online courses that will give you more specific information on biofeedback and neurofeedback. Um, we have a YouTube channel, so you can uh, see some of the videos there. There are demonstrations. There are other presentations there, um, different tips about biofeedback and neurofeedback. There are some interviews, both of people that are currently doing biofeedback or neurofeedback or talking about some of the problems that uh, biofeedback and neurofeedback might address, uh, like working with kids and uh, migraine headaches and traumatic brain injury and PTSD and so on. Um, I've uh, interviewed some people there. And we also have a Facebook page, so you can find us there on, uh, on Facebook under Biofeedback Resources International. And I uh, thank you for attending and reviewing this uh, this webinar. And.
look forward to talking to any of you who want more information. Again, this is Harry Campbell, Biofeedback Resources International, and I'm signing off.